Thank you very much uh, for your presence here. My name is uh, Francisco Monaldi. I'm the fellow in Latin American uh, Energy Policy, and I'm uh, currently also the interim director of the Latin American Initiative that until recently was uh, directed by uh, Erika de la Garza, who is now uh, retired from the Institute, but will continue as a senior advisor uh, to the Latin American Initiative. So we are happy to, to have uh, Erika, uh, Erika here continuing uh, with us. Um, so I wanted to, I mean, this is a joint uh, um, uh, activity event organized by the Center on Energy Studies and uh, the Latin American Initiative because, of course, the, the issue of Venezuela is an issue that has a very significant importance, not only as a regional issue. Venezuela, of course, is uh, suffering one of the worst crises in the, in the recorded history of, of, of the region, uh, both political and, uh, and economic, but it's also destabilizing uh, other countries in the region with a massive emigration of, uh, of Venezuelans. And of course, for a city like Houston, the oil sector has a very uh, uh, a great significance, and of course, Venezuela has one of the largest endowments of uh, hydrocarbons in the, in the planet, uh, uh, and on the other hand, production has been collapsing uh, for uh, particularly, I mean, it has been declining for a long while, for more than two decades, but it has been collapsing uh, recently, even before uh, sanctions were uh, established. So, the, of course, it's a very important topic uh, for us. And we are uh, very happy to have here uh, Julio Borges, the former president of the National Assembly of uh, Venezuela and founder and leader of, of the Primera Justicia Party, the Justice First Party, and uh, Alejandro Grizanti, uh, a leading economist uh, in Venezuela that uh, currently uh, was very you know, recently appointed as member of the board of directors of PDVSA, uh, the ad, ad hoc uh, board of PDVSA. So it would be uh, uh, very interesting to hear. Uh, both of them I will be commenting a little bit on the, on the oil sector in the, in the panel uh, later on. And, and I just wanted to uh, mention that, you know, I know these guys for almost 30 years, maybe more. And we were all uh, in student government in Universidad Católica Andrés Bello, uh, you know, uh, three decades ago. And I have, I'm very proud to say that, you know, that, that they have uh, been leaders in our generation in terms of, you know, developing their careers. Julio did what, you know, we all thought that was necessary in Venezuela to create, you know, a political party to build institutions in the country and to uh, offer an alternative to the parties that were ruling Venezuela in the past and that uh, had unfortunately failed uh, to, uh, you know, make progress in our, in our democracy and that had led to the, uh, to the Chavismo. So I was very proud to see uh, Julio Borges appointed as the president of the National Assembly uh, a couple of years back and uh, Alejandro Vizanti now as member of the board of director of, of, of PDVSA. So with that, I, I will leave the, um, um, Erika will uh, moderate uh, our panel, and, uh, and then we will have some chance for uh, questions uh, uh, that you, you may uh, write down. Thank you very much. So thank you, Francisco. And just to highlight a few more things from our wonderful speakers. First of all, there's a true privilege for us to have three Venezuelan luminaries here tonight. So we want to take full advantage of that. And after they give some brief remarks, we're going to open it to questions. So please write down your questions. And uh, they'll be handed over to me. And I'll sort them out for the speakers. But so briefly, as Francisco said, you know, Julio was um, the former president of the Venezuelan National Assembly, and before that, he served as deputy of the Assembly for 15 years, founded the important opposition party, Primera Justicia. He is now also appointed by the National Assembly as the special envoy to the Lima Group, and uh, has a law degree from Universidad Católica Andrés Bello, a master's degree in philosophy from Boston College, and a master's degree in public policy from Oxford University. Then we have Alejandro Grisanti, who, as Francisco said, you know, was recently appointed to the board of PDVSA and is one of Venezuela's leading economists and head of uh, one of the leading consulting economic firms, Equanalitica. He's done economic research for several important institutions, um, Barclays and Santander, uh, some of them. He has a PhD uh, in economics from UPenn 
a BS in computer science from Simón Bolívar University and a BS in economics from Universidad Católica Andrés Bello. And Francisco's her very own in-house guru um, uh, who is truly formidable to work with and it's an honor to, for him you know, to be part of the Baker Institute, for us to have him as part of the Baker Institute. He's a leading scholar on the politics and economics of the oil industry and oil wealth management in Latin America and developing countries. He has consulted for different governments, multinational institutions, um, and other agencies, including the IMF, World Bank, IDB, CAF, and he's a wonderful professor with high remarks and reviews every year. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Julio to begin our discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, all of you. Thank you for this invitation, Francisco and the Baker Institute. Uh, first of all, to say hello to all Venezuelan people that are here sharing with us this opportunity. I just would like to make a, a brief introduction in order to have a conversation with you and, and uh, in order to, to understand what's happening in Venezuela in the near future and what is next, as the title of the conference says. Well, first of all, I, I really believe that the, the fight that we are strolling in Venezuela is a huge one. There is no president about what we are doing in Venezuela, all Venezuelan people in every corner of the world is fighting for freedom, not only in Venezuela, but all over Latin America and all over democracy in all uh, the, the worldwide. And I really believe that what we are doing is having the fall of the Berlin Wall, but 30 years later, in the case of Latin America. I really believe that uh, we are doing something which is very, very uh, decisive for the future of the region. And that's the cause because we have been in this struggle for so many years. I have the opportunity to travel in representation of the parliament and President Juan Guaido. And the, the question that people said all over the world is how Maduro is still in power why he's in power after all the tragedy that Venezuela is living. And the answer that I have for, for that, uh, which is a, a very reasonable question, is that Maduro has had support in three key elements. The first of all, the most important, is the oil revenue. The oil revenue has allowed Maduro, and before Maduro, Chavez, to, to buy all the political force, not only within Venezuela, but also, as you know, in the Caribbean and in the region, and beyond the region in far places, for example, the case of Spain, or the case of different movement in Mexico, or even in India, or even within the United States. And that has been one of the main uh, support that the dictatorship from Maduro and Chavez until nowadays is still having a very important uh, factor in keeping Maduro in power. As we are talking right now, today, uh, at least 50,000 barrels of oil has been shipped to Cuba this very day. And Maduro, two months ago, uh, got a 400 million debts in order to provide gasoline to Cuba. So he's trying to, to keep this uh, power based on old revenue. The second factor has been the army force. The combination of oil and army force is completely new in Latin America. And there has made a real alliance that has produced the huge amount of corruption and crime within the army force. And the third support is Cuba. So Cuba, oil, and the army force has been the combination in order to keep Maduro in power. The good news is that in the case of oil, and in the case of the army force, has been a radical change. He destroyed the oil industry, and the army force has a very important division regarding the future of the country. So, the only real support that Maduro currently has is based 
on the dictatorship of Cuba, regarding all the violence, the use of intelligence against the army force and Venezuelan people. So that's mainly the reason why we are, we are being doing and dealing with this uh, very important and huge fight that we have had in Venezuela. But in my opinion, uh, we are in a different situation in which uh, all the external pressure due to sanctions and the external pressure due to democratic support of many countries all over the region and all over the world has been producing an effect within the army force and an effect within the Maduro regime. This external factor uh, joined with the internal pressure of Venezuelan people will produce an outcome in the near future in Venezuela. In my view, we are really in the last time in which we, we're gonna see a real end of the dictatorship in Venezuela in the next future. How, how long can be? It can last one day, one week, one month, but any case to see or to, or to have the a scenario of Maduro prevailing in power, in my opinion, has no opportunity to be, a, uh, to be part of a real scenario in the case of Venezuela. So that's the reason why all Latin America and the United States and all democracies in different parts of the world are supporting the fight that we are struggling in Venezuela. And Venezuela, as Francisco mentioned in his introduction, has become a real threat for all the region. The problem that uh, Maduro's regime is creating in Colombia or Panama or the Caribbean or Peru or in the case of, of Chile or Argentina is huge. The immigration problem is a, a real humanitarian collapse of the situation in Venezuela. But besides this humanitarian crisis, there is another phase of the problem that we have to take into account that is the problem related with uh, drug traffics, with organized crime, and with the support of terrorist group, and it was the case of the ELN in the case of uh, the recent uh, attack that was suffered by the police academy in Bogota. All of these situations uh, are deliberate positions, as you know, that Maduro's regime and Cuba try to spread all over the region in order to undermine democracy in Latin America and even in the case of Europe. I, I think that uh, for the near future, we have to be able to see the dimension of the challenge that we have in the case of Venezuela. I think that we really be uh, and feel very proud about the fight that we have been doing not only this year, but since 20 years ago, and as our forefathers and liberators as Simon Bolivar or Mariscal Sucre and all our heroes devoted their life in order to bring freedom to Latin America, our generation has the same or a similar uh, uh, challenge that we have to bring freedom in the case of Venezuela, in the case of Cuba, in the case of Nicaragua. We, as an as a opposition right now, are struggling in order to increase the support of uh, Guaido's uh, government. We are trying to bring together a, a new support for new countries in different parts of the world. We are working very hard in order to bring uh, countries that are part of the problem as Russia, Russia and China to become part of the solution in the case of Venezuela. We have a very strong position within the Lima Group that could build uh, a very important block against uh, Maduro in the case of Latin America and act as a block before Cuba and before Russia in order to bring those countries to our agenda in order to end the dictatorship in the case of Venezuela. So uh, we uh, really believe that with the internal change that the pressure is making within the Venezuela, we're gonna see a different a steps that will go to an outcome in Venezuela. Sometimes 
in this in this process of transition in many countries, there are so many things that uh, right now are invisible for the media or for the communication. But believe me that right now there are so many invisible things that are happening within the army force, within the uh, political realm of the dictatorship, and the pressure from the sanctions and the pressure from the international uh, support and the pressure of the people of Venezuela is working in order to break the dictatorship and build the possibility for a change and a transition in the case of Venezuela. So we, we know that this uh, fight has been very long. I know that most of you have had many years out of Venezuela that has been the case of many of us for different reasons, for political reasons, for family reasons, for social reasons. But I really believe that in the near future, all of us, we're going to have the opportunity to rebuild our country, to unify our country, and to have the opportunity to live in a new, a different Venezuela in order to have the Venezuela that we deserve. I know for myself and for your, for your own experience, that has been a very traumatic uh, experience for most of us, what has happened in, in our country. Each of us, I'm, I'm sure it has a, a, his own story about what is here, what has been the effort to be here, what are the desires and the hopes in order to have change. But I think that all this fight that we has had in these years uh, will be worth it. And we're going to deserve the future that we're going to feel and we're going to bring to Venezuela. And we have to be very proud as a Venezuelan for all the resistance, for all the testimony, for all the struggle that we have been doing all these years. And uh, I know that sometimes uh, we have the uh, anxiety to, to have uh, a real solution and, and a concrete uh, solution before us. But uh, what we have to be is convinced that we are really real uh, at the edge of the change in the case of Venezuela. So for me, it's a pleasure to be here with you. This is just an introduction for, for what you know better than me that is going on in, in our country. And I'll, I will be more than willing to, to answer any of your questions in the conversation. Thank you very much for being here. Alejandro. Great. I would like also start thanking uh, Francisco Monaldi for the invitation on the Baker Institute. I want to congratulate Francisco that he was named one one of the more influential old men in the world. I think that this is something that we need to be, as a Venezuelan, proud of Francisco and his effort to bring all the, but, but, all but the it knowledge. He was among the, the tens most influential people in the world. And he was the fifth. Huh? Uh, <laughs> the fourth. Four, oh, OK. Well. Uh, uh, but really, is a, uh, I am very proud to be a Venezuelan and to be friends of, of Francisco. No? I will be in part, or I will talk more about the economic issues rather than the old ones, and I will bring some, some thoughts about this. The first one is that this is the deepest crisis that any country has suffered without a war. Even in the case that we include a war situation in Venezuela that do not exist, we are talking that Venezuela has lost almost 70% of their GDP, of their production in the last five years. I mean, in the Maduro hands, whenever you see almost any figure, for example, oil production, Venezuela has lost 70% of the oil production okay, in our oil fields. We are starting to be like a marginal producer of oil. But it's not just about oil production. When we see, for example, the portionship power that the Venezuelans are suffering, we are talking that almost the portionship power has reduced by 95% in the 
in the last five years, that the monthly salaries that the Venezuelan receive, the minimum monthly salaries that Venezuela receive is lower than $4 per month at the last exchange rate. Of course, we are expecting a new a, a salary increase for the 1st of May, but the portions of power, given the hyperinflation, will not allow to increase okay, the possibility for a family to, to live. And this is very important to mention, because also it is true, and this is very negative in my opinion or in my view, that the speed of destruction of the economy is much, much faster than the possibility to rebuild the country. For example, the scenarios that we are building on the oil sector, okay, points out that for each year that we are suffering under the Maduro regime, we need around three years to rebuild the production that he, we have lost in, the, in, in each of the years that Maduro was in power. I mean, this means that for the last four years that Maduro was in power, we need at least or around 12 years to rebuild that production and basically that we will need to wait until 2030 in order to see the oil production that we used to have in 2014. And this is something that at the end need to bring, or, or this is something that was very important to start to build a consensus. It is true, and there is, of course, a lot of jokes, that the economy was very hard to have one view of the thing that we need to do. And in the case of Venezuela right now, the crisis was so deep that we started to build consensus, not just among the economists, also among the economists, the political parties, the church, the labor unions, the, 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 the private chambers, and this was resumed in something that we call Plan País, that I will, I will talk a little bit about this eh, 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 in a few minutes. There is another thing that, in my opinion, is very important. I believe that this process is irreversible, that we cannot go back. And one of the economic reasons why I believe that is the, the, that Maduro was not able to stabilize the country, to stabilize the country even in a very low level. If Maduro is able to stabilize the country and give electricity to the population, let's say, for, for 12 hours, but the people will know what are the hours that you will have electricity, what are the hours that you will not, what are the, the, the situation, if he's able to stabilize the oil production in a level of 1 million barrels per day or 1.2 million barrels per day, they can planning about what to do with the, with the scarcity of the hard currency. But something that is happening here is that in the last five years, we have a very strong decline okay, of oil production, of a very negative result on the economic front that, of course, need to be a source of, of, of non-stabilizing the, the economy. I want also to mention that, in my opinion, it's very important that the crisis start well eh, eh, before the sanctions that were eh, 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 dictated by the United States. We have five years of hyperinflation, five years of contraction of the economy, five years of reducing the purchasing power, but eh, eh, with the oil sanction, we just have less than three months. And I think that this is very important to mention in order to be sure that the responsible of the crisis is Nicolas Maduro and nobody else. There is sometimes when I go to this type of, of, of conference, there is always, I, I, I believe that sometimes there is a fear for the, for the future of economic policy, of the future of the program. And I basically, in that case, I am very optimistic for two reasons. The first one, as I mentioned before, is because we were able to reach a consensus, okay, of what we should do, and we are writing that consensus on the Plan País. But the second one, that is also very important, is that Venezuela do not need an adjustment. Venezuela needs an stabilization. And this is not a, a, that I am playing with the words. A country needs an adjustment when their citizens live above their possibilities. The case of Greece, for example. They were receiving loans from Europe. The consumption, that the consumption, the level of consumption that they maintained was very high, 
okay? At the end, they have a financial crisis. The Europeans didn't want to finance the boom of consumption of Greece anymore. They start to stop the loans to Greece. And whenever the IMF came, say, you cannot maintain this standard of living. You need to adjust to a new standard of living, and this is, of course, something that has a political cost. This exactly happened in the case of Venezuela back in 1989. We were living above our possibilities in 1986, 1987, 1988. That was the case recently in Argentina with Cristina Kirchner. And these are moments that you need to stabilize. But I believe that nobody here is thinking or that nobody here is believing that the Venezuelans are living above the possibilities, that the Venezuelans are consuming too much. Okay? And that's the reason that an stabilization a program that stabilizes the price, a program to reduce or to eliminate the same rate control, the price control, etc. A, a, a program that return the, the, the economic rights that the citizens should have and that eliminate the principal constraint, the bottleneck constraint that represent the hard currency that the country and the private sector in this, in this case is receiving. is a country that should first stabilize the economy, and second, to produce growth and to regain the purchasing power of the citizen. I mean, this program could be extremely popular in that sense, rather than to try to see some political cause, of course, that we need to, to see whenever we will fight a, a, or whenever we are thinking to, to eliminate okay, the the, the relative price and, and the increase of the tariff, et cetera, that, that we need to, to look for that. Returning to the consensus view, okay, that in my opinion, again, is very important. I was able to be in Venezuela for, night, uh, for 2017 and 2018 and work with more of the political parties, with the four principal political parties, building a consensus view that we have some countries on the academic front, and we have the support also of the economists. We were able to build that consensus view among the politicians, the academy outside and inside Venezuela, the church, the labor union, the private sector. What we are looking on this, on this uh, uh, proposal, Again, this is not the proposal or the view that Alejandro Grisanti has. In something, I would prefer to change a little bit some of the consensus that we have built. It. But it's not my view. It's not Francisco's view or Julio's view. It's the view of a country that wants change and demand a, a for, change, for some change. We were able, uh, this is also, and I think that this is very important, this is an alive project. This is something that is still are receiving Okay, new consensus, a new sector are still working on this, and of course, this will uh, uh, continue increasing the view that we are having on that front. What says, what basically says the, the plan price for the oil sector that I believe the most, that could be the more important uh, to bring here to rise, uh, and in this case to Baker. First, we need to change the policy and the rent seeking policy in order to change the relation between the state, the citizen, and the relation, of course, with the old. We need to empower the citizens in order to reduce some of the distortion that we used to live, also a, a previous to the Chavez era, okay, with the relation of the oil. The second point is that all agree that the, that the nation, okay, as our constitution say, is the one who owns the hydrocarbon reservoir. But also it is true, and this is very important because it's people from the left, from the right, and from the center who recognize that we cannot do it alone that we need to attract private investment, that we need international oil company to go and invest in Venezuela, that we need to open okay, the oil sector uh, in order to receive that investment. And in this case, we were maybe not very innovative to say that uh, any reconstruction plan, given the, that our more competitive sector is the oil one, that we need to go again to the oil sector to increase oil production and to be 
uh, 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 the oil companies as part of the solution and not part of the, of the problem. We also believe that in the case of the oil and gas, we need to try to maximize okay, the, the, the wealth that the oil and gas could bring to the nation. We already know we have more than 300 billion barrels under the land, how do you say, under, under the earth, that we, cannot, that we cannot exploit. We will not have time to exploit this amount of oil that we have. And of course, at the end, we need to try to maximize their income. We need to try to, to maximize the, the government and the nation take over that wealth that at the end, most of them and many barriers will, will remain idle on the, under the land. I think that we need, uh, and this is another a, a, a consensus that we have, is to have a technical agency, okay, the Venezuelan hydrocarbon uh, agency, in order to deal with all the investment uh, 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 on the oil sector. And there is a proposal to have a new hydrocarbon law, but a new hydrocarbon law that will not impose the vision of one sector. Okay, a new hydrocarbon law that need to bring the consensus of a country that need to open, okay, for the oil investment and do need to open for the oil companies. There is there there need to be a, a new hydrocarbon law that create the confidence, okay, on the investors that they can invest in Venezuela for the next 10, 20, 30 years, okay, to be a partner in some case, or to produce by their own in the case of Venezuela. In the case of the, of the economics that we also bring a consensus, and I will go also very fast on this, we are thinking in a program that we have three stages. The first one will be one that need to address, okay, a very complex humanitarian situation that we are living there. I mean, we need an emergency program to distribute food and medicine to our population, and this need to be there. We are calling that these are three stages because the three of them need to start together. We need to have the emergency program, we need to have an stabilization program that we are already working with the multilaterals, with the IMF and the Inter-American Development Bank. We are expecting to work in a closer motion with the World Bank, but we need to have a stabilization program in order to reduce the upper inflation and in order to get back the, the, to increase the purchasing power of our citizens. And the third one will be the institutional, the structural reform and institutional reform that we need in order to build the, the question. We need to improve the access to hard currency. We already agree that we need to restructure okay, the, the external debt that Venezuela has. I need to say that back in 2014, there was a debate between different economies if you need to restructure or not our liabilities. I think that at the current level of less than one million barrels of production, we can basically cannot pay our liabilities and we need to confront on that front. Of course, the other part of the, of the access to hard currency will come from ex extraordinary financial aid from the multilaterals that we will help us also with the oil investment to recover the, the economy. The third one, uh, 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 in my opinion, the third and the fourth one, in my opinion, are very important, is whenever I just study economics and you have a, a, a government that they are spending much more of their income, a government that have a higher spending than their income. Basically, if you ask a student of economy, you need to reduce the, the spending side or to increase the taxes in order to, 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 to produce the income in order to make the payment of the expenditures. In the case of Venezuela, we need to have a fiscal expansion to address the humanitarian crisis and also to rebuild the economy and the infrastructure that, that we need to rebuild in order to, to increase and to have a, a long-term growth. Of course, this fiscal expansion will be financed by the international community, and at the end, we need to have an independent central bank in order to stabilize price, in order to eliminate the exchange rate control, and in order to have the strength to defend the purchasing power of all Venezuela. 
I will leave also here. I think that I <laughs> talk more than I, I was expecting. <laughs> and Francisco. <laughs> So let me talk a little bit about the, um, I think one very important thing that Alejandro mentioned is this uh, consensus that has been uh, building uh, and that was uh, uh, framed into the, what is known as the Plan País, uh, uh, which uh, really, I mean, I've been, you know, for the last, I don't know, 15 years involved in different, um, you know, efforts to sort of come up with an oil policy in, ben uh, on, in Venezuela on the side of the opposition, and I never seen such a degree of uh, consensus as we have seen in the, last, in the last few years. And of course, partly is, as Alejandro said, the result of, the, of the, how bad things uh, you know, became so that you know, it, it became clear, clearer to all political factions uh, you know, the importance to uh, rebuild the oil sector, but with a, an, an institutional framework that was uh, solid and to avoid uh, the things that you know made it uh, uh, collapse as uh, as it did, and I think that the the most important piece of that consensus is that the private sector will be by far uh, the largest investor in the oil sector, and that the conditions for that to happen have to be uh, established, including you know both a solid institutional framework, but also you know well uh, established property rights, uh, so that uh, you know investors are willing to invest in, in the country. And as he mentioned, you know, that includes, uh, uh, you know, the, the creation of the uh, uh, Agencia Venezolana de Hidrocarburos, or the, you know, a regulatory uh, uh, agency, but also, uh, you know, uh, re-dimensioning uh, and restructuring the, the, the national company, uh, PDVSA. Just to go back a little bit, you know, uh, Venezuela, uh, when Chavez came into power, was producing uh, around 3.4, 3.5 million barrels uh, of oil uh, per day. That was, you know, already, like, in per capita terms, wasn't what, you know, Venezuela used to be producing even slightly higher than that in the 60s and early uh, 70s with a much smaller population. So that, so that, that, that wasn't the same country of the 50s, 60s, and, and, and 70s in which oil, you know, could basically uh, allow for a very prosperous uh, uh, country without, you know, much else in terms of uh, 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 exports. And of course, we had a very low price of oil during the, particularly the last part of the 90s. Uh, one uh, factoid that I've always been amazed is that the, the, the week with the lowest uh, average uh, price of the Venezuelan basket is the week that Hugo Chavez won the elections and, and came into power. And so, during the Chavez term, production declined uh, to, from, as, as I said, close to 3.5 to about 2.6, 2.7 uh, million barrels. And then, of course, during Maduro, until December of these years, collapsed uh, from there to a one, about 1 1.2, and now it's you know, around 700,000 barrels, or you know, uh, uh, depending on, on the source, you, 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 you will see some difference. So. Uh, and, and of course, recently we have had, you know, not only the, the sanctions but the blackouts uh, having a major role in this, in this uh, sort of last leg of the of the collapse. But as Alejandro pointed out, uh, you know, the the, the industry collapsed uh, before uh, uh, sanctions were uh, established, and this is particularly striking, considering that you know during Hugo Chavez, we uh, Venezuela received the largest windfall and the largest boom in oil prices in recorded history. Uh, you know, the country received about a trillion dollars of uh, oil revenues. Uh, if you consider th the part that, that they could have received but didn't receive because of gasoline prices being, uh, uh, you know, basically zero uh, uh, and, or, or very low uh, throughout this period. So what you should have seen in Venezuela during this period was a massive increase in oil production, as you saw in most other oil producers, particularly with a, a country with a resource base, uh, geological resource base that Venezuela has. And what you saw, of course, was the opposite. So the counterfactual is not that during Chavez production decline, you know, not as dramatic as Maduro. It, it, it is that Venezuela should be producing five million barrels, and, and it's producing now 700,000 uh, uh, barrels. So what are the factors that, that led to that? Unbelievable collapse, you know, that we haven't seen except in countries typically, you know, like in Iraq or Iran, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a war period. Uh, 
uh, or, you know, or very strong uh, uh, sanctions, but as I said, Venezuela before sanctions happened. Well, very quickly, you know, the, the first thing, of course, is when Hugo Chavez fired almost 20,000 uh, employees of the national company. Uh, that, uh, you know, basically the, the thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of hours of experience were, were lost there. And the, the reason why we didn't see a, a, you know, a collapse uh, of the oil industry as fast as, as, as later on we saw was because the price of oil skyrocketed during exactly that time. And, um, and basically that allowed to, you know, for massive inefficiencies, for plenty of uh, use of uh, service uh, uh, companies, uh, overlapping you know, service companies with uh, employees from the national company without any problem because of uh, uh, the, the, the massive rents that they were uh, uh, receiving. And, uh, and, and also remember that the, what was called the oil opening had added about a million or 1.1 million barrels of additional capacity. So Hugo Chavez not only benefited from the massive price windfall, but he benefited from the massive oil opening that had happened just before he came into power. So he had a double, uh, uh, you know, uh, tremendous benefit. And that allowed for, you know, a lot of margin uh, for these to uh, uh, happen over the years. If you look at PDVSA's own operated production, without the help of a foreign partner, they were producing about 3.1 million barrels and before this recent collapse, you know, uh, about 500,000 barrels. So from 3.1 to a sixth. Uh, uh, so if, if not for the oil opening, the collapse would have been much worse and much earlier than, than what we saw. Uh, and of course, that was not only it. You know, the politicization of the oil company was uh, unbelievable. You know, the, the head of PDVSA was the vice president of the political party in government, was the head of the political campaign of the president. That, that's a level of politicization of an oil company that we don't have seen even in the worst cases elsewhere. Uh, the, 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 the company became almost like a social ministry. The, the, the minister and head of PDVSA didn't care about, you know, production. His, his job was to find money for President Chavez and to execute uh, the, the social programs. And then not only with that, they started doing other things to the company. You know, the massive overvaluation of the exchange rate meant that the company didn't have enough. Uh, you know, when they changed uh, the, the, their dollars in, order, in Bolivars, they didn't have enough money even to pay salaries. So uh, we started have, having something unheard of in the world, that the central bank of a country in the middle of an oil boom is lending massive amounts of money to the national company in order to operate. You know, again, uh, the level of distortions and of craziness, uh, I, 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 I haven't seen it. I mean, I have, I have seen plenty of this management in, in, you know, in the world, in, in, in national companies, nothing like this uh, uh, at all. Uh, also, they did the, 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 the Chinese uh, uh, financial ar arrangements by which Venezuela received over the years more than $60 billion in loans and, and um, you know, repaid with oil, and so they committed the future oil production. And so, but, but since they didn't invest the money in oil, but they spent it elsewhere, uh, um, uh, mostly in, in things that never generated a return, uh, basically, you know, they couldn't pay back, and they were only betting on, you know, the price of oil continued to, uh, uh, to go uh, 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 up. Of course, that led, uh, and, 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 and they were, taking money out of PDVSA like crazy through all these mechanisms to an extent that Venezuela had a deficit of 17% of GDP in the year of the peak oil price. And Venezuela and PDVSA was in massive arrears with, uh, you know, with uh, partners and with service companies when the prices were already high. Um, uh, so Im imagine uh, those, the, nivelli, the, the level of responsibility, you know, of, of lack of uh, that, that we were witnessing uh, uh, at the time. Of course, when the price of oil collapses, then we see this uh, total disaster. But it was all in the making for years. And I think that's very important because even though uh, Alejandro mentioned a lot about Maduro's responsibility, I mean, this is a, a responsibility of the last 20 years of accumulated uh, a terrible mismanagement of the, uh, of the oil and gas uh, sector and, and as well as, as, as the economy. What is the way out of this? Uh, of course, uh, Venezuela is blessed with this 
very abundant endowment in three different sort of potential options, you know, offshore gas, the Orinoco uh, extra heavy oil belt, and the conventional oil of Venezuela, that even though uh, at this point we don't have a good number about the real reserves uh, of Venezuela because they haven't been audited and there, there is a lot to do to actually come up with a good assessment of the situation of the oil sector, we still know that uh, Venezuela would have in conventionals uh, uh, more resources uh, uh, and potentially more, you know, reserves than even countries that are, uh, you know, blessed also like Brazil or, or, or Mexico. And this is without considering the extra heavy oil. But that requires massive investments. These are the co conventional fields are all, all fields that have been, you know, in, in, in decline are either mature fields or, uh, you know, uh, some are actually inactive. And, uh, and that, of course, in the Orinoco Belt, that's also the case. And in offshore, we are barely, you know, starting to develop something that Trinidad developed, you know, from 20 years ago uh, and when Venezuela should have started. Uh, so that would require uh, more than $15 billion of investment per year uh, in, the next, uh, uh, in the next decade or so uh, in, in throughout the, uh, all the hydrocarbons uh, uh, sector. And, and that, uh, as both uh, my predecessors have mentioned, you know, the, the effort of Venezuela in terms of social programs, in terms of, uh, you know, rebuilding the infrastructure of the country means that, uh, you know, one, the opportunity cost of using the dollars of the state in the oil industry, and of course the dramatically lower capacities of the Venezuelan uh, state-owned enterprise means that uh, by far, uh, the, the large majority, maybe even more than 80% of this investment in the, last, in the next decade or more will happen through the private sector if Venezuela is successful in attracting uh, uh, those uh, uh, investments. And um, the, 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 I think if, if everything goes well, then production might you know, go back to three million barrels in, 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 a, in a decade or so. There, there might be at the beginning some uh, opportunities for rapid growth, but a sustained growth of you know more than 100,000 barrels per year per, uh, uh, per day per year in Venezuela has been only achieved in, in a very few in, in the best of, of times, right? So I think we can achieve more than that for a while, but you know for 10, 15 years uh, that will uh, that will be a, a challenge, and of course with all the other issues of political stability and the like. But I think we will see a significant uh, increase. And the last point I wanted to make is that even in the best scenario, Venezuela will never go back to be a, a rich oil country in the sense that the size of the Venezuelan population today, even if you produce five million barrels of oil, uh, even if the price of oil is reason reasonably at, at a high level, this does not allow for the Venezuela of the 50s, 60s, or 70s. Uh, so Venezuela will have to diversify. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, and, and of course, there are plenty of ideas in that area. I'm not you know, an expert in, in, that, in that regard, uh, but that's very important to know, that even though it will be a very significant engine for the, recoper the recovery of Venezuela in the short term, uh, you know, in the medium term, this is not enough to make for the society that Venezuela, uh, uh, you know, that we aspire uh, to be. And at its best, it, you know, it would be like $2,000 per, per, per capita, per, per, uh, you know, in terms of, of income. That's not something that, you know, that will make for a, a high uh, or mid-high mid uh, income country. So there will be, there will have to be uh, many other efforts besides uh, the oil industry. And that's my uh, commentary. Thank you. Okay, as you can see, we have a lot more questions than we'll be able to cover. But I'm going to start um, with a few and weave in a couple from the audience. So, uh, could you tell us a little more about foreign? powers in Venezuela? Because you mentioned Cuba as a steady power for the past 20 years, but then we also know there's China and Russia. And we recently saw Russia uh, send <coughs> military personnel um, to Venezuela. And also in the case of China, um, the US Southern Command recently mentioned how um, China had this disinformation campaign blaming the U.S. for the blackouts that recently um, devastated Venezuela. 
So if you could comment a little bit on the foreign powers um, that are at play and you know, what role are they playing? And also, if Cuba is the main enemy, what will it take to get rid of Cuba? And can Russia and China play a role? Sure. Well, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, our main threat, without any doubt, is uh, the presence of Cuba regime in Venezuela. Uh, for Cuba, the case of Venezuela is a case for life or death. That's the reason I, I told you that the struggle that we are doing in Venezuela is literally the fall of the Berlin Wall in Latin America. And uh, the dimension of the money that Chavez and later Maduro has provided to Cuba has been essential for keeping the regime alive in Cuba. Uh, you may see this very week how started important shortage of food in Cuba uh, due to the pressure on the economy of Venezuela and the new sanctions on Cuba. And this process will get worse. It, it won't improve. And uh, in my view, uh, Maduro is just following and a script uh, written by Cuba and is under the Cold War mentality. And we have like two plays at the same time. A Cold War play made by Cuba and, and Maduro, uh, which the, his premise is just to resist, uh, thinking that the world would change that we're going to have elections in Argentina, or we're going to have elections in the uh, United States, and the geopolitical uh, board will change. And they can resist, as Cuba has done in the last seven decades. And you have the rest of Latin America playing a post-Cold War game, which is based on a building democratic pressure on, a, on a, a Venezuela. Uh, it has been very hard, I, ca I have to tell you, to push the Lima Group, for example, to accept the problem of Cuba within Venezuela. In all the meetings that we have had, uh, I have been pushing to declare Cuba as very important piece of the problem of Venezuela. And unfortunately, until the last meeting last week, it has been denied. They don't want to, to have a fight with Cuba. But the problem of Venezuela has grown uh, so fast that in the last statement of the Lima Group, uh, there is a mention clear to Cuba, Russia, and China. And we are preparing to, uh, to, to travel a group of uh, foreign ministers uh, to each of these countries in order to, to present a regional solution for Venezuela. What we want to say clearly is that the solution of Venezuela has to be built in the region, not in Europe, not in China, not in Russia, but in America. And that's something that we want to create a real block in order to call the other countries to follow our agenda in the case of Venezuela. Uh, secondly, in my view, uh, Russia's interest is not as existential as, as is the case of Cuba. Uh, in my opinion, Russia just wants to be a, an important player in the solution of Venezuela. They don't have the, the muscle, the strength, in order to keep uh, the regime of Maduro alive. As you know, the, the economy of Russia is, uh, is a, really a small one, uh, even smaller than Spain or or New York uh, is a, a very small economy with his own crisis. And in the case of China, uh, my own experience uh, thought me that they really want a change in Venezuela. I, I had the opportunity to travel to China a year and a half ago, invited by the Chinese government. And I, I have to be very clear, the place in which I heard the, the war things about Maduro was in China. It was not Miami, it was in China. <laughs> they, they think that Maduro is a corrupt guy, that the deals in the oil sector has no sense, they don't follow the rules, 
And that's the reason you may see in the United Nations and in the public statements uh, some uh, uh, prudential position of China regarding Venezuela. So uh, in my opinion, again, uh, our main problem that we have to face in order to have a, a chain in Venezuela is how to uh, make Cuba part of the solution. Many countries has helped approaching to Cuba, offering different solutions. They have been completely closed. And now we are starting another strategy, which is pushing with uh, hard measures against the Cuba regime in order to say, well, if you don't want to be part of the solution, so you have to suffer uh, as, a, as a regime uh, in order to change uh, Venezuela and to have an opportunity for change in Venezuela and also in Cuba. Okay, Alejandro and Francisco. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention, I, by the way, I, to, to give a plug of my, I just, uh, today it was published a, a piece that I made for the America's Quarterly, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the magazine of uh, the America Society and uh, Council of the Americas, that basically I argue that China could be uh, a really important part of the reconstruction of, of, uh, uh, of Venezuela. I mean, it has to dramatically change the, the, the way the, this relationship has worked in terms of you know, transparency, in terms of uh, you know, actually the, the resources being used for uh, mostly for you know, oil production and, and productive uh, um, activities. Uh, but I do think that you know, China is the largest oil importer of oil in the world. Uh, uh, Venezuela produces extra heavy oil that, uh, you know, basically China and India are uh, among the few customers outside of the U.S. that might uh, process that. The U.S. will have, you know, a lot of substitution because of Canadian uh, oil coming to the Gulf Coast. So uh, without a doubt, I think China would be a long-term partner. And I think they have signaled, as you said, many, many times that they will work with any, you know, government in Venezuela that it's a long-term re relation. Uh, and, and I think that that's something that can be built. In the case of Russia is slightly different. They took the opportunity after the Chinese decided to close the spigot of you know, money going to Venezuela. The Russians uh, took advantage of that to become very aggressively active in, the, you know, in, in, in taking positions in the Venezuelan oil sector. I, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Sechin, who is the head of Rofneft, uh, actually will make a lot of money if there is a transition because you know the the, the oil sector uh, will benefit from that but it's also true you know that some people argue that for the for Russia it's attractive that Venezuela is down because the price of oil you know goes up so so they, there is a um, uh, sort of a mismatch of interest uh, uh, there and it's and it's a more complex uh, relation but without a doubt it's, it's it's very different from from the case of China okay I think a few of these have to do with oil, economics, politics, but so regarding Plan País uh, that you were mentioning, this incredible consensus among all of these different stakeholders, and you mentioned the economic aspects and how they're addressing that, and Francisco, you also mentioned the importance of private investment and the right framework in order to attract this uh, private investment. So there's a few questions regarding, so I don't know if it also includes this Plan País, if it also incorporates security, because a lot of questions have to do with narco uh, trafficking. Then also um, things like corruption, are there any rules in play you know, or, or plans um, to address corruption, tax reform, um, that kind of thing. Are those part of Plan País? Is that also being discussed? Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the, the proposal of Plan País is a proposal that is alive, that is starting, to, that, that is continue receiving, okay, different proposals for different sectors, and also, I need to say, for the oil sector, for the, for the economic plan, etc., is something that is alive, no? Something that is happening in Venezuela, as I mentioned before, is that the situation is changing. And the way that you were thinking in Venezuela, for example, before the electricity crisis need to be different today as used to be as, as sure as Ferrari. I mean, we have an important change right now, an important bottleneck on the electricity sector that we will need to handle and we need to, to bring, okay, the, the, the electricity sector uh, and to give a higher importance of, of the electricity sector inside the, the plan país. And this is, again, this is something that, that, that is alive, that we are still working, that, that many people, and I will say that most of the best of the people in the world 
has in one way to the other given opinion about what we should do in different things. For example, we open a, a debate of what exchange rate regime we should have. Okay, at the beginning we were thinking that we need to use the exchange rate as an anchor to, to, to bring down the inflation. It is impossible to do it using monetary policy. Rising interest rate will not be part of the solution. You need to, to have a, a, a well-financed balance of payment in order to reduce inflation and to use the anchor of the inflation rate. And basically we are asking for the best of the people that want to to help on that from Oliver Blanchard, uh, Somers. I mean, we have meeting with different people. Uh, one important uh, approach that we are having with the, multilater with the multilaterals is that they have like the, like the best practice manual, that best practice thing that they can ask what advice. And again, this is a lot of things that we were working on that front and that we are able to, to get inside the, the different proposals that we have. Okay. Um, also, regarding some of the politics, um, so is there a timeline for the government to transition? <laughs> There's a question um, about you know 2020 almost around the corner, and that's when the next president of the National Assembly would be appointed. So will Guaido continue being president indefinitely? Also, that the Constitution requires elections to be held within 30 days, and um, of Guaido, you know declaring his president's interim presidency. Why hasn't that happened? Mm -hmm. And then there's also a few questions regarding what does it actually take for this transition to happen? And military coups are part of the questions. Like, is that, and, and, and the fact that the United States continuously uh, threatens with all, for, you know, all options being on the table. Mm -hmm. you know, what's the likelihood of that? And I know that Lima Group does not um, subscribe that, but what, in general, what are your opinions on that as well? You can start. Well, no, uh, yeah, I'm Spanish. Uh, well, I, I think different things about different questions. <laughs> no, listen, uh, we, we, are, we are have been studying different transitions uh, here in America and Europe. Also, we are preparing a, a workshop in, in Chile at the end of May uh, in order to, to, to study deeply the case of Chile, Ukraine, Poland and Spain, uh, and to see all these experience what may have in common. And if you guys want to go, you're invited. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, a, a something that is a, organizing the Chilean government. And I'm, I'm telling you this because all the experience shows that success, success is based on the will of following a set of a framework. Once different parts are willing to follow a framework, the development of a transition could be made. And uh, in the case of Venezuela, uh, we prepare uh, a document that is called the Estatuto for the Transition. Estatuto para la Transición. Uh, I don't know if uh, I, I can give you not only the document, but also the explanation of each element of the document. It will be very useful to you to, to read it. And uh, what we want to, to say to Venezuela and to the world, that we have a set of rules in order to follow uh, an ordained process of transition in the case of Venezuela. And uh, uh, the idea is to, to have some all the different questions that this difficult situation that we are living may have a, a very important set of answer in an ordained way. For example, the case of how long has to last the transition in Venezuela. In our view, transition should last the time that we will be able to produce a very fair and free election in the case of Venezuela. How, how long can it take? 
our, our technical and political view is that it can last at least 10 months from the first day until the elections day. And uh, we should be able to take uh, some measures in order to uh, guarantee governance for, for Venezuela. Someone asked about the issue of security. Uh, we have a, a talk before this one, and we said that our main concern is really the security issue. All our economic problems, our social problems, our political problems pale regarding the social, uh, the security issue in the case of Venezuela. The problem of destruction for uh, drug traffic, organized crime, uh, corruption is so huge and so deep within the structure of the state that in my view, this is our first problem that we have, even beyond the economic problem. How, how, how are we going to deal with that? It depends on how it will be, at the end of the day, the, the outcome and the role of the army force in the outcome in the case of Venezuela. But uh, we, we really believe, this is my, my view currently, that we already have chance to see a, a pronouncement, a position, and a step forward from the Army Force. A, in the past, for example, at the beginning of this fight, I thought that we have plenty of reasons to, to expect some answer, some movement from the Army Force. And it's very disappointed that the Army Force has been so passive and so a coward without doing anything so far. But I, I really believe that the pressure is making some uh, important influence. And I, I really believe that it's possible to think uh, that we may see a reaction from the Army Force and from political factors within the regime. I really believe that is a real a scenario in, in Venezuelan case. Regarding the military intervention, this is a very controversial issue, but I have a, a very important uh, position for myself. In my view, the, the tragedy that we are living as a country is worse that, than any radical uh, position that cannot be taken in the case of Venezuela. What I want to say is the worst thing that can happen in Venezuela is that nothing happened. That, that's something very, very clear in my opinion. And in my view, in order to avoid something like that, you have to create a credible threat. And that's, that's a, this is a psychological problem in which we are right now. Maduro thinks that nothing will happen to him. So he feel free to do whatever he, he wants to do. On the other hand, I really believe if there is a credible threat that there is a real limit in order to achieve democracy in Venezuela, I really believe that could see a different dynamic in the case of Venezuela. In that sense, my worst scenario regarding that is that the crisis in Venezuela is still growing and I live right now in Colombia and it's really painful to see thousands of Venezuelan people in the streets uh, begging for food, and you see each day the number growing and growing, not only in Colombia, but you know, all over the region. And the economic crisis that Francisco and Alejandro uh, made a description could be so worst that the situation could go out of control to everybody, to Colombia, to the United States, to all the countries, and people have to, uh, and the situation compel to do something without a real plan. So for me, the situation is so fragile and so desperate that in the next weeks or month, we may see uh, a situation that, it's, that, that can be out of control and a, it could obligate to take force measures in the case of Venezuela. So in my opinion, a, we, we are, working for these pressures, this political pressure, this international pressure. They are working, 
I really believe they are working. There are a lot of invisible things that are happening in Venezuela right now, but uh, we should be a, a vocal and open in order to say that if the situation for any case continues, we should be able to put uh, an end in the, case of, uh, in the case of Venezuela. Again, the worst thing is that nothing happens in Venezuela. For me, this is not an option, and I really believe that uh, we're going to have uh, this outcome in the case of, of Venezuela. Okay, so a follow-up just to... I don't know if I was clear, but I tried. <laughs> <laughs> for clarification purposes. So you said it, you think it would take about 10 months for to have the right structure for free and fair elections? Is no. It, I really believe that we, we're going to have a, a change in the short term in Venezuela. I think that uh, if we don't have, if for any reason that doesn't happen, we have to push for for uh, for having any kind of option in order to obligate a change in Venezuela. And from the first day until the very day of elections, more or less this transition uh, can be uh, around 10 months, more or less. Okay, once a new government is in I, place. Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's the transitional government. Right, okay. All right, uh, a few oil-related questions. So. Um, how will the new PDVSA or new government secure payments of billions owed to services providers and vendors? Um, then what, regarding increased production scenarios, uh, what are your views on how realistic oil rents can contribute to meaningful impact given the international oil markets? Is there a way to help the common citizen to benefit from, from oil? Um, and let's, yeah, if you could comment on start the oil scenario. Well, in terms of, you know, Venezuela, and uh, in this uh, regard, Alejandro could elaborate on this, you know, has the, the highest debt uh, relation with exports in the, in, the, in the world by a magnitude, by a significant uh, magnitude to, to the next country. So basically, it's a, it's a country that is uh, broke in a very, you know, dramatic uh, way. So that means that there is a long line of different uh, um, you know, entities with claims on Venezuela of, uh, of a variety of natures, right? From bondholders to uh, uh, companies that were expropriated to uh, uh, service, oil service companies to partners uh, of uh, uh, PDVSA to you know, uh, airlines uh, that, that didn't get their uh, dollars, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this will be a very complex uh, uh, process uh, of, you know, of negotiation. But without a doubt, the oil sector is a priority because you need service companies and your partners as part of the, of the solution. So you need to very quickly uh, you know, use the opportunities in the oil sector uh, to solve uh, this uh, situation and uh, move ahead. Uh, uh, you know, to get uh, investment and to get the, the service companies back uh, into, the, uh, into the country. And that's part of what is needed in terms of a transitional framework in the, in the, in the, either in the new oil law or in a partial, you know, uh, transitional reform of the, uh, uh, of the oil law. And, uh, um, you know, it, it is uh, it's not going to be easy. I think the multilateral agencies like, you know, the IMF will play a very significant role in the sense that you have other countries plus the multilaterals putting billions of dollars, maybe, you know, uh, upwards of 60, 70 billion. And, of course, they, they don't want that money to simply go back to pay the, all the, the, the creditors. Uh, uh, that, that, that's not a deal for them. Um, and, and, and as a result, you know, the, there has to be an organized way in different areas to, uh, you know, uh, restructure and renegotiate uh, uh, these, uh, these debts. Some of them are, you know, harder to solve than others. Some of them have stronger claims. Some are, you know, really going to be part of the solution because they are, you know, as I said, service companies and, and, and and oil companies are a key uh, component of any uh, any solution, and in that sense, they they are in, in a, a you know in a good position to uh, to be part of the solution uh, and, and to and to get ahead. Um, I forgot the other. Uh, 
Uh, also, actually, let me just add, because there's a couple also discussing, you know, like why is Venezuela still, you know, like completely focused on, on, on energy resources? Like, could, you know, or is there anything else beyond fossil fuels? Is there a plan to diversify the economy? Sure. I mean, as I said, that's, that's not my area of speciality, but without a doubt, that, that's uh, one of the key uh, components of any long-term economic plan in, in, in Venezuela. I mean, the oil industry will not be enough. It is true that now we will have also the, the natural gas industry, which is, uh, you know, a, a really important in the energy transition that we are living in the world, and Venezuela has a big role to play there, too. Uh, but, uh, uh, by the way, Venezuela has an, an amazing hydro capacity, and, 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 you know, in that sense, South America and Venezuela, you know, are, are ahead of many other regions in the world in terms of the, uh, the use of renewable uh, energy. Of course, one of the big crazy situations that Venezuela has is that it gave, gives away for free, uh, you know, fossil uh, energy, uh, both in terms of, you know, electricity, uh, in terms of natural gas, in terms of uh, gasoline. And, and that's, that's something that has to be uh, corrected. It's one of the major things. And, and by the way, there, we, we do have in that area very detailed uh, plan uh, from long ago that basically uh, it's sort of similar to the idea that you know Secretary Baker and other proposes for, for the carbon tax in the U.S. in the sense that it will be a dividend uh, for the for the citizens. You increase the price, but it will uh, you know to the international level, but it will be distributed the cash generated uh, a significant part among the, the the population in a way in which. Uh, our estimate is that about 70 to 75 percent of the population would be better off, and the ones who are worse off are among the wealthiest. So it would be a very uh, effective. That would be a cornerstone, I would think, of a of a plan in Venezuela. It's a, it's a it's a difficult issue because you have to to uh, you know make the population understand that they will be better off. Otherwise, you know, uh, which which is true. The 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 things that in the in the meantime you don't have you know a political mess with a, uh, with the notion that uh, that you have to. Uh, rationalize the uh, energy prices, but you know there are, there are plenty of, of things that have to be done for Venezuela not to be so focused on on, on energy, but uh, on fossil energy. But without a doubt, Venezuela has a window of opportunity to develop these resources uh, that has to be taken advantage of, and it's one of the few things that will allow for a recovery that is relatively speedy compared to what it could be. Uh, if it didn't have those uh, uh, resources. So, you know, I, if I go to these meetings of Venezuela and college students called Plan Pais too, and, you know, and, and the kids always want to discuss about renewable energy, about a solar and, 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 and wind, et cetera. And, of course, there is a, 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 some role to, for that to play in Venezuela, but there is no doubt that the elephant in the room in Venezuela is how to, the, you know, use the hydrocarbon resources that we have in the next three decades, uh, um, you know, and, 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 again, not sufficient, but absolutely essential piece of the puzzle in the, in the medium term. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I will also take the question that, uh, and give you some examples, no? I did a, a, a balance of payment exercise. For example, what happens if Venezuela pays all the debts in the time that he needs to pay, it's not that we will go the liabilities to zero, no? Is that all the bonds that have a maturity in the next five years we will pay, that we will pay the interest payment, the interest payment that we will also address the whole investment that Venezuela needs, that we, in a five-year term, that we will put the per capita imports at the 50% of the Latin American average, okay? That we will increase the, the per capita imports at that level. And at the end, when we see the number that we need or the deficit that we need on the balance of payment, that deficit was so big, $220 billion if Venezuela wants to do everything by themselves. This is impossible to do it. So the capacity to pay the liability of Venezuela is simply not there. So how you will finance this $220 billion? I know, first, we need to attract all investment between 50, 60 billion dollars. I hope that will increase to 75 billion dollars in the next five years, need to come from international oil companies. We need also to reduce, to restructure the external debt because we don't have the money to pay. Okay, we need to, of course, and this is very important, we need to go with the hand of the IMF, okay, measuring the capacity to pay that Venezuela has 
okay, in order to restructure the debt, okay, with the different bondholder that we need to that we need to have. So this is another point that we need to raise. We need to raise money from the multilaterals, and then we need to close the gap, okay, on that front. And at the end will be, I need to say, a very hard one, but a possible one. The second thing is something that we start to take some step step in the in the case of the debt restructuration. We are, we already create under the the President Guaido a, a debt committee, okay, that is starting to meet with lawyers, that is starting to meet, for example, something that is very important with a, a contingency agency, a, a, an agency that will make, that will do all the audit process in order to be what part of the debt is legal and what part of the debt is not legal. I am sure that we will start to see some promissory notes coming from PDVSA that some of them could be legal, others will not. Of course, the, the most of the bonds is very clear because they have a, a, an indenture, et cetera, that they are legal, but many debt that we will see will not be legal. And we are starting to work on that front. I hope that anytime soon we start to to make some announcement of the law, of the strategy guide that, that will advise all of in all the restructuration process and the possibility and the possibility of the different law firm will have will have to, to help us. This is a process that we are trying to take advances on this. We need to protect the PDVSA assets, and this is very important, and that's the reason that we are a, a, a following, okay, and a strategy that will be very conservative in order to try to, to protect the asset that Venezuela has all around the world. Okay, and I believe we're running out of time. Maybe one. One more question, okay. Well, um, on a happier note, maybe. Um, there's several, um, you know, volunteer organizations um, here in Houston and everywhere else. And they would like to know what are some of the ways that the Venezuelan diaspora can actually help um, bring about meaningful change. So what are some of the things that the general people could do? Yeah. Well, uh, next Saturday we're going to have a, a meeting of all American ambassadors in Bogota in order to, to build a plan for, for the different representatives in the different countries. And one of our main concern is how to help to organize Venezuelan people uh, all over the world. Uh, in, in my opinion, something that we are missing right now is our capacity to energize all the people, all the Venezuelan people who are abroad in order to make a petition demonstrations and to push and to create this climate of a, of a spotlight of the Venezuelan case. So uh, I, I'm more than willing to, to help to any of these organizations in order to, to make the links, the proper links with the people uh, here in the United States and even here in, in Houston and Texas in order to articulate something that could create this uh, worldwide effect. Uh, today we create in the National Assembly like an official uh, uh, orient in order to orientate the Venezuelan people abroad. So uh, I don't know if you want to write down my uh, WhatsApp or whatever in order to be communicate and uh, uh, huh? Yeah, we could also, because you also mentioned a document that you would like, it's not the Plan Pais, but some, uh, yeah, we, we can, another document. We can mail to you the Plan Pais and uh, El Estatuto for the Transition, the documents that explain each point of the Estatuto of the Transition. Uh, I don't know if you have a... a we could make of, them available through yeah, our web page. Sure. If we can put it on, a, on our website. Sure. That would be the easiest way to do it. Or, or links to, to them, mm -hmm. because they're, they are in some other web pages as we can exactly. get them. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to make, I mean, I have, many of you have heard me uh, say this, but you know, one of the reasons why I, I thought it was really important to, uh, to have, you know, Julio and Alejandro here is that without a doubt, the city of Houston and the Venezuelan community in the city of Houston, and not only the Venezuelan community, the, you know, the 
uh, energy community and the, and the business community in Houston will have a major role to play in the reconstruction of, of Venezuela. Uh, um, you know, there is no other city that concentrates uh, you know, uh, as many talents in, in, the, in this area that will be a cornerstone of the development of, of, of uh, the, the, the Venezuela in the next uh, decade or so as, as Houston. And, um, you know, the, the Venezuelans will incorporate themselves and others into the, uh, the development of the oil industry in, in many different ways. Some might not, you know, go back to Venezuela. Some might, you know, uh, the, uh, some have, you know, uh, companies, some are entrepreneurs, might, might, they might, uh, uh, you know, participate through the uh, service sector. Some uh, will go as, uh, you know, employees of the service companies. Some will go back as employees of the uh, international uh, oil companies. There are plenty of services around the, this uh, area, like, of course, you know, law services and the like. So uh, uh, this city and the Venezuelan diaspora here, I think, has an amazing energy. You know, the, 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 what happened was terrible for, for Venezuela in terms of the brain drain, et cetera. But if you think about all the capacities that have been developed, compared, imagine all the, that same people that had stayed in Venezuela. They would not have had the experiences they have had, the knowledge they have uh, outside of Venezuela. Of course, uh, that doesn't mean that it wasn't traumatic for many uh, of us. Uh, but you know that that all that energy will be tremendously consequential in, in terms of the its effect in the development of Venezuela. Yeah, and I want to thank Julio, Alejandro, and Francisco for sharing their knowledge, uh, but also more importantly for you know your commitment and continuous fight in trying to improve the life of the Venezuelan people, and to the members of the community who are tire tirelessly working you know to send supplies and help Venezuela also, thank you. And we'll meet again to discuss Venezuela. Yeah.